Learn to Brew series, episode one. In this episode, we're going to cover the four major ingredients when it comes to beer, the entire process from start to finish, and some key brewing terms that you need to know. Hey fellow hop killers, my name is Dylan with the Hop Killer Brewery, where we bring you the brews, reviews, and how-tos. Episode one of this series is going to be the outline for the entire series. This episode is going to be a general overview of everything from ingredients to brewing process, and then in later episodes, we'll follow up in greater detail. This series is designed to get you to brew great beer and giving you everything you need to know to do so. If there's something in particular you're interested in learning about in this episode, I will link the timestamps down below in the description. For any questions you have on a particular process or ingredient, Make sure to ask me now down in the comments so that when I get to the video about that specific ingredient or process, I can include your question in that video. Each video is going to be pretty in depth, so I'd be surprised if I didn't cover it. But if you do have any questions, comment them now so that I can get to them later. So we're going to cover the four major ingredients being water, malt, yeast, and hops, and the entire process from start to finish, and some key brewing terms that you need to know. Before we dive into this episode, if you get any value from this or like it, make sure to give me a thumbs up. If you're excited about this series and you want to follow along or you're interested in any other brewing related videos, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And without further ado, let's break into it. So there are four major ingredients when it comes to brewing beer. That's water, malt, hops, and yeast. There is no particular order in this list, but we're going to generally discuss their importance for each one. Water being roughly 90 to 95% of beer, you want to make sure you have good brewing water to start with. What is good brewing water? Mainly you want to make sure there's no chlorine or chloramines in your water that's normally used as a treatment process when you get your water out of the tap. In the future water video, we're going to go into greater detail about what water you should use for certain styles or if you have good water at home, how you can adjust that water to fit a particular beer style. Now water modification or importance of water isn't necessarily needed to make good beer, but in this series we're looking to make great beer, so it's important. Malt is a grain that is under the malting process, which is basically germination and kilning. This process gives that newly malted grain the enzymes which they're going to be able to use in the mash to convert starches to sugars. There's usually two categories of malt, base and specialty malt. Base is what a majority of your beers are made of and then specialty malts are there to sprinkle in your recipes to give it the desired flavor and color that you're looking for for whichever beer you're brewing. Specialty malts have their place in certain recipes and I'll go into that in greater detail in the malt episode to this series. For the sake of this video, malt is what gives everything a platform to stand on. It gives it a lot of character. Primarily, it gives it the sugar content to create alcohol in the finished product but malt is the structure or the backbone for a beer. Hops, the ingredient that gets most of the attention by brewers and a lot of attention by the consumers and for good reason. They do a lot for beer, but a few things are they contribute bitterness, flavor, aroma, stability, and some antimicrobial properties. At least in 2021, there's a lot of hops out there on the market, but there's always the tried and trues like Cascade, which is made of Sierra Nevada's pale ale. And then there's bangers like Citra, Galaxy, Nelson, and a few others. They're constantly coming out with new varieties. Hops are in every single beer style, more pronounced than others, depending on which style that beer might be but they do bring a lot to the table, and even if they aren't the superstar of the beer, they still do a lot for it. With all the new banger hops that are out there, you can have everything like guava, mango, tropical fruit, and from some of the classics, you have the piney, resinous, citrusy, earthy, sometimes herbally characteristics, and they can all be used together to create exactly what you're looking for. Now, yeast. Being brewers, our job is to set the stage for whichever yeast strain we decide to use for the beer that we want to make, and to make sure they can have a healthy, vigorous, and good fermentation. Poor fermentation creates off flavors, poor attenuation within the beer, and a whole other slew of problems that I will break into more on the yeast video to the series. One thing I can suggest now, buy the book Yeast by Chris White and Jamil Zanichev. It's one of the best books I've ever read when it comes to brewing and it's completely changed how I look at yeast and yeast handling and yeast management. Now that we've covered the four major ingredients when it comes to beer, 
let's talk about the entire process. After I cover the entire process, at the end of this episode, there will be the key terms and some acronyms that you need to know or will help clarify from this entire video and future videos to come. Since there are so many different ways to brew beer currently with there being brew in a bag being very popular, two vessel systems, three vessel systems, this entire grain to glass description is going to be based off a three vessel system with a hot liquor tank, a mash tun, and a brewing kettle. I will be discussing a brew house configuration and setup video in this series, so make sure to tune in for that if you're curious as to what the pros and cons are for each style of setup and which one fits your needs. So it's brewing more and you're excited so let's get going let's get started by filling up the hot liquor tank this is going to be the vessel that you use to heat up water for mainly your mashing and your sparging you're going to heat up the water in that hot liquor tank and this is going to be called your strike water the temperature of the strike water varies depending on your projected mash temperature that you're shooting for there's an ideal ratio of water to grist which basically means how much water for how much grain you're using in your mash tun and we'll go over that in the mashing video of this series once you get that water where it needs to be as far as the temperature goes and the amount that you need you're going to send that water one way or another whether that be a pump or manually or allowing gravity to do all the work for you into the mash tun once all the water is there or while the water is transferring you're going to start to want to add your grain into the mash tun and stir to not create any dough balls which are basically a section of grain that's mixed with the water where the outside is wet but the inside is clumpy and dry this isn't going to allow for proper extraction and your efficiency is going to go down. But no worries, all you got to do is find them and break them up. In the mash tun is where the wort is going to get created. Mash time usually lasts for 60 minutes, sometimes more, sometimes less. Everyone has their preferences, but for this sake of this video and for the sake of the series, we're going to base it off a 60 minute mash. This is going to allow enough time for those enzymes to break down the starches and convert them into sugars and allow you to extract the most sugars possible for your wort. Once that 60 minute time is up, for the mash, we're gonna do a process of loudering, which is separating the wort from the grains that you use to create the wort. Before we can send the wort into the boil kettle, we need to do what's called a vorloff. A vorloff is where you take the runnings from the bottom of the mash and you pour them over top the mash tun until the wort that you're pulling off the bottom is clear. What's happening inside of the mash tun is you have a filter that is underneath the grain, but then as you recirculate them, the mash bed or the grains inside the mash tun themselves act as a filter as well. Once this is set, it allows for clear wort to run off, leaving all the grains and husks behind in the mash tun where they belong. Some mash tuns have false bottoms, some have manifolds, some have brew in a bag. Again, we're going to cover all this in a future episode. Once that wort is running clear, your vorloff is complete, it's time to send all that wort to the boil kettle. The next step of the brewing process is what's called sparging. The sparging happens either after or during your wort is being collected. Why is there two methods? There's batch sparging and there's fly sparging. What's the difference between batch sparging and fly sparging? Well, batch sparging is basically draining all the wort from your mash tun at first, adding more hot water from your hot liquor tank, to then rinse the remaining sugars off the grain inside of the mash tun, mixing it all up, vorloffing again, and waiting for the new second runnings, what they're called, to get clear, and then you run those off into your boil kettle to join in your first runnings from your mash tun, creating the total volume of wort to be boiled. Instead of draining your entire wort all at once, fly sparging utilizes a method where you're draining wort and adding water at the same rate to create a more efficient mash extraction or extraction of sugars than batch sparging typically does. Fly sparging is a method of continually running off wort from your mash tun while continually adding water from your hot liquor tank on top of the mash at the same rate. Why is there a difference? Well, basically fly sparging can be more efficient of sugar extraction in your wort than batch sparging. By how much is up for debate and it's a heavy topic amongst home brewers. I'll tell you right now, you do not need to fly sparge to make good beer. Fly sparging usually requires more equipment and it takes longer, though there is more control features that you have when it comes to fly sparging over batch sparging. But if this is your first few batches or your first one, you do not need to worry about it. Just batch sparge, don't fly at first. Now that we've collected all our wort into our boil kettle, let's get this boil going. If you're still watching this all the way through, comment down below what episode you're most excited about and why. And again, if you have any questions, drop them down there too. I will make sure to add them into that particular episode. So why do we even boil wort to begin with? Well, there's a few major reasons. The number one reason why we boil our wort, and this is in no particular order again, 
is to sterilize it and kill off any other previous microbes or bacteria or wild yeast that were in that wort to begin with. Number two, concentrating the sugar content by evaporation. Number three, boiling off any precursors that will lead to diacetyl in a final beer, which is that nasty butter-like flavor. Number four, isomerization of alpha acids with our in hops to create bitterness. And there's a lot of other ones that go along with boiling and there's a whole slew of chemical reactions and process that goes on depending on what's been included in that boil that we will cover in a future boil episode. During the boil, we will be adding our hops and other things that might be in your recipe. And the boil is typically for about 60 minutes. Depending on when you add your hops, you're gonna be extracting more bitterness. Usually when you add your hops at the beginning of the boil or at the very start, that's gonna be boiled the entire duration. So it's gonna be extracting more bitterness. If you add your hops later in the boil, or actually when you turn the flame off, you're gonna leave a lot more of those uh, flavor and aroma compounds that are desirable in certain styles. We're gonna go over all the hop addition timings, amount, how they contribute, what, what they do, when, and everything in the boil episode of this series. After the boil is over, we're going to whirlpool and chill probably at the same time, depending on the chiller you choose or have. Whirlpooling does a few things. Primarily, it makes the chiller more efficient if you're using an immersion chiller, and two, it helps settle out all the true hops and protein into a cone shape at the bottom of the kettle, allowing you to extract or pick off more wort from the side of the kettle that it's gonna go into your fermenter, and it's gonna be cleaner wort headed into your fermenter, leaving all the undesirables in the boil kettle. Whirlpooling isn't necessary, but it does help produce better beer, in my opinion. Whirlpooling can be with a pump, or it can be as easy as just spinning a big spoon inside of the kettle while it's still close to boiling temperature and getting that circular motion going for a few minutes and then stopping to let everything settle out to the bottom. We need to chill our wort from boiling down to the appropriate temperature depending on the yeast strain we're choosing. Now that the wort is chilled, you have entered into what I call the cold side. The cold side starts after the boil and after the chilling. Why is this such a critical time when it comes to making beer? Well, basically from here on out, anything that touches the wort or comes in contact with the wort needs to be sanitized. Went through all the process of boiling and killing off any wild yeast or bacteria that could spoil your beer, there's no reason to mess it up now. Making sure everything's clean and sanitized is key from here on out until you're drinking the beer. How do we do that? Star Sand is a very easy to use sanitizer. I have it linked down in my description on every single video. So whether you're using a pump or a siphon or just a hose to get the wort into your fermenter make sure everything is sanitized and you're good to go once you've transferred through your sanitized method and the wort is at the temperature appropriate for the yeast strain you're planning to use you can then add the yeast to your fermenter add the airlock or air blow off tube whatever you're using and you're good to go fermentation begins now i am not going to go into detail in this video but just know average fermentation time usually lasts between 10 to 21 days even longer if you're talking lagers even longer longer if you're talking sours normal beers usually about the two week mark and it's ready to keg or bottle i'm going to tell you right now kegging's the way to go bottling's nice it's cheaper at the beginning it takes a lot more time a lot more cleaning it does have its perks but in the end i think you're going to convert to kegging if you pick home brewing as a hobby long term after the 10 to 21 days is complete. Your beer is now ready to drink. It's either in the bottle or in the keg. You can now crack that bad boy open or pour it off the tap and enjoy. Now let's go over those key brewing terms and acronyms that you should know from here on out. You might have already heard some in this video, but this should clear it up. Hot side, the entire process, including the boil. Cold side, the entire process after the wort has been chilled until you're drinking that beer. Packaging. From the fermenter into the keg or bottle or can, that's a package and that's packaging. Pitching yeast or yeast pitch, this basically just means adding yeast to the fermenter. Hydrometer, a tool used to measure sugar or gravity of your beer or wort. Carousing, the foamy head on top of your beer slash wort during fermentation. Fermenter, any food grade vessel that you ferment in. Dry hopping, big keyword when it comes to IPAs, double IPAs, hazy IPAs. Dry hopping is literally adding hop pellets or hop cones into your fermenter either during or after fermentation but before packaging sparging the process of adding water on top of your grain bed to extract the residual sugar that was left over from your mash acronyms hlt hot liquor tank mt mash ton bk boil kettle fv fermenter cip clean in place 
That was the ingredients, the process, key terms and acronyms. If I miss anything that you want to know or you think others should know, again, comment down below. This is a video for everyone in a series that's going to help everybody make great beer. This has been episode one of the Learn to Brew series. I'm super pumped to bring you guys the rest of this series. I'm unsure as if we should start ingredients first, process first, or what. If you have any preference, make sure to let me know down below in the comments. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Cheers.